Hey, welcome to Voice Over Body Shop Tech Talk number 32. It's 32 this time. It yes. is 32. I have counted. We've lost count. We've done so many of these. We've lost count. But you guys love Tech Talk, so we want to make sure you get the best of Tech Talk. And we got a lot of cool stuff to talk about tonight. Like, George, what do you got? Oh, we're going to talk about uh, <laughs> remote recording primarily oh. because that's <laughs> obviously what a lot of you are being thrust into doing. And there's a lot of confusion and misconceptions about this. Maybe something about birds. <laughs> Maybe something about birds. Oh, I got a great answer for that. So stay tuned. If you got questions, throw them in the Facebook chat room. Jeff Holman's on chat room duty, and we'll get to your questions right here on Voice Over Body Shop. Tech Talk, coming right now. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to Voice Over Body Shop Tech Talk. Voice Over Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Hi there, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Widow. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS yes. Tech Talk. Doom, 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 doom. Anyway. Well, there's an, <laughs> there's an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times. And if the, these aren't them, you know, this is... This I don't is, know what is. This has been the wildest thing. I mean, most people are like, where am I going to... Is my next job going to come from? How am I going to... You and I? No, we have been the man. Because you guys are like, I got to have a home studio. Even people who have home studios. And they had no idea whether they sounded good or not. Now, now they're calling. Ten years we've been telling people, you got to have a home studio. You got to be able to record remotely. And now suddenly the studios are doing and suddenly it's their idea. So, yep, it's funny. We're, well, you know, it's it's just so the, the, the business of voiceover. Was it, wasn't it Corvo a long time ago? Dave Cavassier who said there is no voiceover industry. Well, um, yeah, it, to him, it always seemed like, well, when you say industry, it means smokestacks. Most of that's coming out of our ears right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a television industry and a radio industry and an internet industry, but there's the voiceover has incredible number of, we call them verticals, you know, all these different areas of voiceover, and right. they all work differently, and they all have different demands on the voice actor. And surprisingly, we didn't, I mean, I don't even think I realized how many voiceover actors we're still getting away with all these years, not actually having a professional home studio, just nothing really more than an Apogee mic in the closet. Right. So now they're getting caught with their pants down and there's a bit of a panic. So we're trying to allay that panic and get as many people who are actually interested in getting this problem fixed as possible. Yeah. Helped. Yeah. Spending a lot of time being a therapist and saying, you know, and telling people, mm, I don't know where you heard that from, but. Anyway, so uh, if you need help with your home studio, and that, like I like to say, that's all of you now, 
uh, there's a couple of places you can go. One is you can watch this show because we give you a lot of information and help you out. But two, if you'd like to work with us individually, George and I do this professionally. I'm a voice actor. George is an engineer. You know, I've played an engineer on TV, but that doesn't really count. But I do enjoy working with people, and George loves working with people, helping them get their home voiceover studio, sounding it the way it's supposed to sound like. Whistle. And uh, there's, there's no secret sauce to it. Every room is different. Every voice is different. And George and I know what it's supposed to sound like and how to get your sound the way it's supposed to sound, which, of course, we will talk about and elucidate more as the show goes on. But, George, if they want to work with you, and, and of course, who wouldn't, where do they go? You can head over to georgethe.tech. That's the website for my all, tech, all my tech support. Um, if you're looking for products related to voiceover, um, obviously, first, you should visit our sponsor on our show voiceover essentials but if you need another source um, i've got a, a page on there called home vo studio now that has a whole bunch of gear you can check out that are things that i've been recommending to a lot of folks but also you can order uh, order on-demand support or self-service support depending on what you need even just send in a sound check or on dan's website he calls it a specimen cup Yes, we'll the specimen. That, Dan. Yeah, the specimen collection cup. You scroll down to the bottom of homevoiceoverstudio.com, and boy, that thing has been filling up. There have been lots of people saying, "How does it sound?" And it's like, well, here's how I, you know, here's how I judge the quality of your audio. And there's the three things that I like to talk about, and we'll get into it. If it sounds fine, if it's little minor adjustments, we can deal with that. If you really don't know anything about a home voiceover studio, I can teach you from soup to nuts and get you from, you know, being out of the closet and into your closet and recording like a pro in pretty short order. So uh, go to, over to homevoiceoverstudio.com. So much for the commercial part of that. What's on your <laughs> What's in your tech update this week? Well, you know, something that's been coming up with my voice actor clients is they're being asked occasionally to do some pretty advanced engineering sleight of hand. Like and, what? Um, yeah, you know, like, and my, so my, I just came up with the title of this segment called, Whose Job Is It Anyway? Hmm. Um, I think it's copyrighted. It's, it's getting ridiculous uh, sometimes what the voice actor has been asked to do. And I've had clients in the past occasionally who've taken on like extra duties, um, be above and beyond the call of duty, you know, um, you know, such as being able to have, uh, two people on a phone call at the same time, or one person on ISDN and another person on a phone patch on the, in your studio. And what I've had to remind people is just because you can, or you have the technical acumen to do it doesn't mean that you should. If you're doing a session that's being remote recorded over technologies such as ISDN, Source Connect, IPDTL, Session Link Pro, whatever the case is, if there's a studio engineer who's been hired to run the production, make sure the takes are being recorded, log the takes, all that kind of stuff, that is their job. Their job is part of that, is to make sure all the communications between yourself and the client, and if there's a producer, someone else, somewhere else, the producer, or, you know, sometimes there's even more people involved in a production of a voiceover, it's their job to handle all those, all those duties, being the traffic cop of audio, the mix minuses between Source Connect and the mix minuses between Zoom and Source Connect, and what does that actually mean, and making all of that work seamlessly. That is not your job as a voiceover actor to have to worry about that. So um, if you get asked that question, definitely let them know that no worries. We'll make sure the engineer will set that up for you. Don't take that on yourself. So I just want to don't, don't freak out if that comes up. It's completely not your job. Now, if you're self-recording, it's not a source connect, but it's a Zoom or Skype type session or a phone patch as we traditionally used to call them. Then that's a different story. So now you are wearing the engineering hat 
on top of everything else and sometimes even the producing hat. And so now it's some, it may just be you and the, and the talent. Um, sorry, you're the talent. It may be just be you and the client, the actual end user who's going to be using your content. Oftentimes will be the case if you're doing pay to play type work, then um, that's a different situation. And yes, you will have to facilitate that in most cases. Um, and in which case now, because we've gotten pretty custom using Zoom, that's not such a big deal anymore. Yeah, anybody can start a Zoom call, send out that contact's information and get them into the call. So don't overthink it. Don't freak out. Let them know that if it's Source Connect, you're paying for that studio and that engineer's expertise. Let them hook it up. Um, this also tangentially works off that a little bit, but now people are being asked to, especially people that have been custom going into studios to work to picture. Um, now they may have to work to picture at home. Um, mm -hmm. Dan, have you had to do deal with anybody thrust into this world of having to work to video or picture? I, well, I've done a little bit myself. Uh, some people have talked to me about it, you know, that they're going to have to do that. Of course, they've got some cool technology now where there's some companies are using like video karaoke to try and, and to, to help people with the when they're dubbing stuff. And there's a lot of dubbing work going on here in L.A. A lot really, of, tell me about the video karaoke thing. I hadn't, I had, I let, let's kind of make this a back and forth because I know what I've been, you know, asked to check on or figure out, but I haven't heard that use uh, yet for, yeah. as a, as a problem solving device. Yeah, no, there's, there's a program that I, a couple of producers you know, have, have used and I've, and I've you know, worked with them where it's, they're giving you a section of video or film or whatever it is. And the words are synced to the actor and they scroll across the bottom of the screen so you read it as it's going on and therefore it's easily synced and so that working to picture it makes it makes it a whole lot easier oh, cool of, is this a is this done through a website uh no, i don't think it's a website i think it's an actual software platform i don't know the exact uh -huh. name of it but i know several producers and companies some post companies that are doing a lot of dubbing work are using this now so that now would be the great time to be using that all over the place and making it easier for all of us to be dubbing films from home. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a couple of challenges involved if you're going to work what we all we call in the in the audio engineering side of things sync, working in sync as opposed to recording wild. Just to do, you know to explain some terminology, recording wild means you hit record or the engineer on Source Connect or whatever hits record. And you just go there. You just read the script on, on your own timing. Whereas working in sync, sometimes also working to picture means that the timing of your read is completely dependent on what you're seeing on, on a playback of a video. And that's a whole different thing. So now to do that kind of work, obviously you have to have a monitor in your booth. Okay. So if you've been working without a video display in your booth all this time, that's no longer going to be possible if you're asked to do this kind of work. So you have to have a keyboard, monitor, and mouse connected to the computer that you record with. Um, it's chances are, if you're using a MacBook or any kind of a laptop in your booth to just record audio, that's probably not going to be viable doing work to picture for the technical reason that if you haven't heard your fan yet, you're going to now. <laughs> right, yeah, if you're running something like that, it's going to start really taking the resources. Yeah, if you're working to picture, your computer is going to be working a lot harder to do that. Um, it's it, The video side of things puts a lot more of a load. So now that computer fan is going to be cooking. Um, I hear it a lot now because when I'm helping people over Zoom and doing remote desktop and we're testing systems out, I start hearing that computer fan going like crazy. And they'll, you know, voice actors will say, well, I don't normally hear the fan. I'm like, well, if you're going to have to do Zoom on this uh, session, you're going to hear the fan. So be ready for that. You may have to relocate a computer that normally is quiet enough out of that space. So a, key, a separate keyboard monitor and mouse is the solution to that. 200 bucks grand total to buy a keyboard monitor and mouse that'll work on Windows or Macs. Not an expensive endeavor. Um, you just need a little creativity in running the cables and such, but it's, it's totally doable. But be ready for that. You may have to do that to deal with that issue. Yeah. Um, so Dan, yeah. earlier on, you mentioned something about a problem with birds. Yeah, I, I had a question from a client who 
was emailing me back and forth and it was really going back and forth and it was like one question at a time and then he's like okay i recorded something uh and but i could hear birds outside in the background how do i fix that you know everybody's like in oh post, this... that's hard to fix yeah it's like oh everybody thinks you can fix that stuff in post so my immediate answer and every time i tell this story to somebody they all come up with the same thing i did i said well first double pane windows and second a shotgun <laughs> Um, and, and now about a half hour later, I get an email back from him and he says, Oh, you mean for the birds? Cause he thought I was talking about a Sennheiser 416. <laughs> 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 so anyway, yes, I'm sorry. No, even, even the super directional Sennheiser 416, it'll pick, pick up, up a bird. The bird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, That's I mean, what they use the for nature like films for picking up birds for crying out loud. Okay, well, you don't necessarily have to shoot the birds. Just the loud sound will quiet them down for a little while. If you, if the worst case scenario, you could even get a. Well, I don't even know if you could get one. No, gun stores are still considered essential. <laughs> they businesses. are essential businesses. Here you in can go get <laughs> even a Target or Walmart. You can get a starter pistol and uh, a starter pistol for starting a foot race or something. And, uh, you know, I know it's kind of loud and maybe your neighbors aren't going to like it so much. Don't do this in an urban area, but if you're out in the burbs or way out in the country, you can fire a starter pistol <laughs> to quiet down those damn birds. And it might work for a little while. Um, Thank anyway. God for the second amendment for crying out loud. Get rid of those <laughs> birds. Don't shoot at them. Just make a loud noise. That'll right. do it. Yeah, Yelling um, also last... helps too. I... Yeah, exactly. Um, lastly, a little show and tell. So, Headphones. Dan Dan's using an eye in ear monitor tonight, so he can be a little more less obtrusive with headphones. Um, we've talked about you know ways to take direction in the booth. Um, now I typically am an over the ear headphone guy. I tried a couple in ear style headphones over the years. Nothing ever really, you know, sways me going to full headphone or going away from headphone. But as of lately, there's been a huge onslaught of extremely scarily inexpensive in-ear professional style in-ear monitors such as these i'll hold this up so you, you've you've seen every pop artist on television or live with these in their ears right now typically these things are quite expensive um if they're made by the big manufacturers like ultimate ears and sure things like that you're going to spend way north of a hundred dollars sometimes 500 plus dollars or a professional pair of these. And one of the things that makes these so incredibly expensive at the high end is actually what's going on inside this thing. No, it is not a single driver inside like you might expect. In this case, this has, count them, six drivers. <laughs> there are six, six different six sounds. Six drivers. <laughs> yes. Think of your... Think of your stereo speakers from of your the old days, where there was a whole bunch of different speaker cones you know, some of them are for bass, mid-range, treble, three-way, four-way speakers. This is like a six-way speaker in your ear. <laughs> so um, $60, by the way. <laughs> I bought these for $60. There's six drivers in each side, so they call them the 12 hybrid. Why is it a hybrid? Because there's two kinds of drivers in here, dynamic and um, oh, what's the other kind? Not linear actuator. It's another word for it. I'm drawing a blank. But anyway, I've been trying these out. This particular pair, I'm going to read out the name, is the Kinbufi, K-I-N-B-O-O-F-I, Kinbufi, maybe, K-Z-Z-S-X, in-ear headphone monitors. Um, if you want to find these on Amazon, and give them a try. Yeah, make sure you spell it right, though. I, <laughs> I am, the jury is out on these things. First of all, they are unbelievably revealing. If there's any flaws in your system, if your headphone amplifier has any hiss, if your audio from your microphone or your voice has any mouth noise or sibilance, these things magnify all of that stuff in a dramatic way. So they might drive you slowly insane because <laughs> they have so much detail. But for just listening to music, um, they're pretty darn remarkable. I find them to be really bright mid-range in the mid-range area. Um, 
that's just my hearing. I'm I'm really sensitive in that upper mid range range or what two to four K or whatever it is. And these are very sensitive in that area. So these are not for everybody. But if you've lost hearing in that range or you're used to the really bright headphones like the Sony's, you might find these to be quite remarkable. Um, so something just to try out if you want to get away from over the ear headphones and want to try something lighter and really, really sensitive and detailed, give those a try. Interesting. All right. I've never, you know, I use earbuds. I hardly ever use headphones at all, you know, unless I'm listening to something really carefully. Yeah. So I got an interesting subject that we can cover here because I, yeah. I, I had to give someone a lecture on Facebook over the weekend and uh, not a nasty mm -hmm. lecture, but a, you know, a Socratic lecture asking lots of questions about this, but it starts off really, if you've been watching any of these homes, you know, you know, music stars at home videos. One of the things we're seeing is some really bad microphones. <laughs> it's like, you know, Lady Gaga gets on there or Andrea Bocelli gets on there. They got a good microphone and they sound fabulous. Sam Smith comes on and he's got a pair of Air AirPods in his ears and he sounds like me. So, uh, <laughs> Guys, I mean, for crying out loud, you're professional musicians. You should really have a good microphone. That being as it may, the question came to me this week about, well, I'm a singer. What microphone should I get? Everybody's getting these, uh, the SM7Bs, the Shure SM7B, which is a, you know, a legendary broadcast microphone for, for radio studios. And, but, and you're seeing, and you're seeing them in, in, in a lot of these home videos now. Uh, you know, one person has it. Everybody's got to own it. It's the hot mic to have Joe Rogan. Thank Joe Rogan for yeah, that. Yeah, really. But he's doing a podcast for crying out loud. Right. But so I had to explain to, to this person that, okay, if you're a singer and you've got an Epigee mic, which is what this person had, I said, singing is not voice acting. Singing is a completely different dynamic. If you've got it, and you, generally it's the microphone you have that's going to be just fine. So why, you know, if we go through the, you know, the Sweetwater catalog, why is it like page after page after page of all these beautiful microphones that no one's ever going to see? And, you know, it's, uh, the thing is, if you're singing and you are projecting, you are loud and you turn the gain down and therefore it's going to pick you up just fine no matter where you are the acoustics of the room are not going to be as critical because you're going to be singing it's probably going to be mixed with other things and the ambiance of your voice can be adjusted in the mix of that so therefore it's not quite as critical what microphone you have unless of course you have a really crappy one like sam smith and uh so it doesn't really matter what mic you have. You can have an SM7B, that legendary broadcast mic, or, or an RE20 or 320, one of, the, one of the other broadcast mics. What were originally developed as bass drum mics, so go figure. You have to sing very close to those. You have to be a little bit closer. And in singing, you can get away with that, which is why you use a dynamic, but not necessarily, say, an SM58 or 57, which is a stage mic. Uh, so I generally will recommend to people if they're singers and voice actors, you might want a different mic, but you can make that same mic work for you in either genre, but the usage is different. As we always say, all of this stuff, every last bit of the equipment we use with a few minor little exceptions was all designed for recording music and that we are just adapting these wonderful instruments for our own purposes. And so we need to learn different things about mic proximity. I've been talking to a lot of people about, well, controlling your levels, good voice actors, guys who really know their, know their stuff, you know, guys like Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche and, 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 and Joe Cipri guys, we know who are the big time guy. They understand, especially the animation guys, how to use a mic's proximity properly. If you're going to yell, you don't yell in somebody's ear. You turn and you go, I will kill you. And you don't have to worry about, 
you know, adjusting your volume. You learn what the proper distance from the mic is depending on the loudness of your voice. And seeing that most, con most voiceover is very conversational, people need to learn that they've got to give it a lot of gain, and that's why they need a good quiet microphone and a good quiet interface to do voiceover. It's not quite as critical with music. You know, if you're doing demos or if you're sending tracks somewhere, because everybody's sending each other tracks right now. Uh, your thoughts on that, Mr. Widow? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it, has, it certainly has a lot to do with the singing style of the singer, too. Like, um, the name Billie Eilish comes to mind. Her thing is like... She's very quiet. Yeah. Her <laughs> thing is like, um, well, it's almost like the ASMR of pop singing. <laughs> um, you don't know what ASMR, look it up, Google it. <laughs> but, I mean, she does sing uh, very softly sometimes. So, for her, like a very sensitive uh, microphone is going to be really critical. Whereas if you're, um, you know, the singer of Metallica, and I know he's known for singing into like an SM7B, you want a microphone that isn't incredibly sensitive, one that can handle incredibly loud vo volumes. Whereas voice acting has some relation to that where you can be, you know, maybe doing character voices or animation, but we tend to work the mic a lot differently than studio singing because we, we tend to put a lot more space between us and the mic. Um, you know, with singing, it's like you want the mic to sort of really dramatically and sometimes in some ways really enhance the way that you sound. And in voiceover, it's not as much about enhancing the way you sound as more sort of honestly capturing your performance and the way you sound. Um, you know, we don't like make love to the microphone and look right at it and speak right into it generally because we're trying to get something that's more natural the way someone would listen to us speak to us right in any kind of conversational context so yeah there's some definite differences there between when you're how you're going to shop for mics and what mics to to look for i can you buy a studio condenser mic that works well for singing and voiceover yeah of, of course, course. <laughs> a lot of it is just at the end of the day mic technique absolutely you know yeah i came up with a good one another another saying which is piling up right now and that is a lot of people try and fall in love with the microphone and we of course find that in the voiceover business but the real key here is let the microphone fall in love with you because you're the one that you're trying to sell you don't sing to a microphone you're singing to other people you got to learn how to be a performer as a voice actor and not rely on the technology uh, you know let George and I handle that stuff. We know what we're talking about. But learn how, you know, different mic proximity works with different microphones. But you can probably get away with one microphone if it's the right microphone for you. Anyway, we got a ton of questions from people, and we're going to get to all of those and enlighten you on all these incredible things that we know about voiceover technology right after these incredible and important messages on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're listening to Voice Over Body Shop, VOBS.TV. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing, and there's jeans for working. Dickies. Because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. It's now time to talk about Harlan Hogan's voiceoveressentials.com. Now, today, Amazon Incorporated shipped its last PortaBooth Pro from their inventory. And as you know... The demand for many goods and services needed for those working from home has exceeded supplies, and both their Plus 
and pro recording booths are no exception. Now, you may have also experienced long shipping times, even for audio equipment that's in Amazon's inventory. Now, VoiceOverEssentials.com, the manufacturers of the Portabooth Plus and the Portabooth Pro and Harlan Hogan Signature Series audio gear, is shipping now. And they have ample inventory of everything voiceover talent, podcasters, and broadcasters need to produce professional-sounding audio from home and on the road. So if you're in need of home VO studio gear, and now that's everybody, go on over to voiceoveressentials.com and see all the great stuff they have that's shipping now. Well, it's that time where we talk about Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect. Well, if you guys have been paying attention, and I know you have because you're watching the show, but maybe you've skipped this ad or maybe you've heard this ad and gone, yeah, 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 Source Connect, I don't need it. Nobody ever asked me to use that. Guess what? You, at this point, if you don't have Source Connect or at least a working demo that you know works and you've run through this, the process of setting it up and testing, you're not ready to be working the top level voiceover work today because pretty much all the studio producers, any of the major commercial outfits, certainly if we, we already know promo and things like that, are pretty much all being done now via Source Connect. So you need to be ready and get yourself set up with a demo. In fact, head over to georgethe.tech slash SC. Um, I've made a page on there to answer a lot of people's questions about Source Connect. There's some tutorial videos, some uh, checklists on what you need to have to be ready to do Source Connect sessions where you're being asked to record and be directed live um, with another studio. All sorts of resources over there. But go check it out because Source Connect is, is inevitable. Um, if you're doing commercial voiceover work, any of the higher budget work, chances are you're going to be doing it on Source Connect. So head over there, get set up with a free trial, um, or just get the license going because you know you need it. You can even subscribe monthly if you like. And uh, tell them we sent you. Anyway, we'll be right back to answer all those tech questions right after this. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on The VoiceOver Body Shop. And we are back here on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. Uh, and we got a lot of questions here tonight. And uh, let's see if we can cover them all. A lot of them are, it seems a lot are like, what do you recommend type of questions. So you may not get quite the answer you want, but we're certainly going to give you the answer we want to give you. Anyway, starting off with uh, Jeff Holman. We know Jeff. He runs the chat room, so he gets the first question. And he made it bold and huge. Yes, yeah, so he wants to make sure that we, <laughs> we, we catch this one. Uh, what do you think of Studio One Digital Audio Workstation? A lot of audiobook narrators seem to like it. George? You know what? I know a lot of different DAWs to different degrees of you know proficiency. Um, this is one I don't know very well yet. Um, part of it was because early on when it was coming out initially, um, I never could get the sound drivers to work with the software. And so I would just keep running into a brick wall after brick wall. And eventually I would just change, you know, change direction and go back to something else. Now we're going, I think they're on version sound studio. And by the way, this is made by personas. I think they're up to version four now. And so it's, it's definitely gotten extremely popular among a certain set of, of, of audio professionals. Some of those are audiobook narrators. And um, a lot of it has to do with one particular uh, audio expert that is loves and really knows Studio One. And that's a guy named Don Barnes. Um, he's uh, also known as Red Barnes or Red <laughs> Barnes Audio or something like that. He, he is got it dialed. At this point, when somebody asks me if they know anything about, if I know anything about Source Studio One, or they say I use Studio One, there's a 95% chance they've probably met Don or worked with Don or in his Facebook group. It's it is a great tool when it's taught to you by the by an expert and it's set up for you by an expert. In the same way that he's a, a real guru on the Studio One, that's how I kind of am with the uh, Universal Audio Apollo. In the wrong hands or when it's not set up correctly, 
you might as well just be using a Steinberg 2 I or two um, UR22 or a, a focus right or a mega simple <laughs> yeah i mean because these things can get you in a lot of trouble and i feel the same way about studio one it is a very powerful production software like cubase nuendo pro tools reaper need i go on so no, um, don't. If, if, <laughs> yeah if it works well for you great it's not something that i'm going to quickly get behind using um it needs to be trained and set up correctly for that purpose so um there you go. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I hear the same thing. A lot of people talking about studio one and you're absolutely right. You have to know how to use it. It's not something you're going to learn overnight. It's if you've had some experience in a multi-track recording studio, it helps a whole lot because these DAWs are designed to emulate these multi-track studios with lots of processing and all that stuff. Most of which most voice actors have no need for. You know, like I like to say, it's like getting a control room for a nuclear reactor to control a hamster running in a wheel. You know, <laughs> it's it really is overkill for that sort of thing. That said, it has lots of versatility and it's it's cool. And usually it comes as a free add on when you buy something from Personas. Um, That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, check it out. What George and I really look at when we when we evaluate these types of products is does it help the voice actors workflow because essentially they all sound the same there one doesn't take the ones and zeros from your microphone and treat it any differently than any other piece of software it's just translating it into that computer language that allows us to get a graphic representation of what our audio is doing it's just that these more sophisticated programs allow you to do lots of other things that were primarily designed for doing music, but they apparently, so if, if look, if you're doing audiobooks and it helps you with your workflow, fabulous. All right. How about, uh, Gerard Maguire, Gerard Maguire. Yes. Living yes. down there in Sedona question about RX voice D noise. What are the ideal settings? Well, it depends, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. Is that one of the ultimate depends questions? So to me, the ideal settings are when they're set so that you can't tell you're using them. Exactly. So if, if you use denoising tools and it sounds like you did something to the audio, sounds like there's something funny going on. You didn't do it. Right. Not set right. That's right. You, you do have to set these by ear for sure. Um, but I always start with the sensitivity as low as you can get away with, you know, once you get above 10 or 12, the set that you know that the the artifacts that are caused by using a denoising tool start to really get in the way and, you know i think of this tool as a restoration tool that's what it was designed a for producer who's stuck with subpar audio and all they can do to re to restore it and make it usable is to process scrub the noise out the best they can but i don't think it should be part of someone's normal production workflow especially if they've got their studio set up correctly, especially if they're using processing that dialed in correctly, using things such as downward expanders, high pass filters, EQ, even possibly a um, de-humming filter, you know, a notch mm. filter or a parametric EQ to get rid of the 120 Hertz hum in your home. You know, those things can all go a very long way to cleaning up the audio without having any real negative artifacts. Yeah. I, so I always lean on those things first. Yeah. I, and I find that, you know, and my philosophy is always do everything you can physically in your studio to get the sound right up front. Uh, you know, I mean, so like, like we were talking about proper mic technique, proper acoustics, setting your levels properly. If you can control all of those physical elements, you really shouldn't be using all these different noise things that said, you know, we get emails from people. I got a noisy neighbor. I got birds. I, I've got all these other things. I yeah, got an air conditioner. About, yeah, these these voice to noise tools really only help with sounds that are consistent, like a drone, right? A droning hum or a droning air conditioner or a white noise that's consistent, but they can't handle impulse noises like a chirp of a bird or a slam of a door or anything like that. They just can't. They don't remove it. That's right. So um, don't use these things compulsorily, you know, make sure they're, they're being used to really fix a problem when they need to be fixed. Uh, people say, can you just throw that into my processing stack? 
Yeah. Like, no, I, I, no, I won't because it's not being used. Don't just throw it on everything you're doing. <laughs> you need to know when to use it and how much, you know, cause it can really, uh, it's, it's definitely going to be audible by a professional audio engineer. They're going to know you're using it. You futzed with it. Like it. Don't futz with it. All right. We got to, I get, uh, I've been waiting to ask this one because this is from our good friend, Jack DeGolia, who was out there in the desert doing whatever it is he does out there. And he says, uh, a colleague in the UK is asking me about a spec from a client that includes one parameter neither of us has heard of, CBR. You mean the motorcycle? No, 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 no. Oh. It's, it's, uh, the quote, uh, the, the spec is, the file should be finished, proofed, edited, mastered audio, 320 kilobytes, CBR. Have one second of room tone at the head and two at the tail. Measure around 20 dB RMS, peak of greater than 3B or less than 3B. So what is CBR and do you know of an app that measures CBR? Now I'm I, literally, first of all, I just Googled the entire phrase. I figured you would. Notes, <laughs> see if that <laughs> phrase was anywhere on, you know, that could come up in the Google data. I, I already Googled it too. So I Googled right? it when he asked, but. So now I'm going to, now I'm going to just, just check out CBR. It's it's a oh. it, it has to do with recording CDs primarily. It's a CBR. Oh, constant bit rate. Yes. Yeah, that's one of those settings that it's so. How do we put it? We've always done it in CBR, like from the date from day one. That's I've right. never ever seen anybody use VBR. So I guess it became a foregone conclusion, but I guess it's not because certain softwares leave it on by default and guess what that certain software is audacity Aha. when you first save an mp3 i believe it's an audacity yeah the default setting is some kind of like preset called high quality or right right something else and 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 in that setting it's using variable bit rate um here's a quick little google answer cbr stands for constant bit rate and is an encoding method that keeps the bit rate the same when audio data is encoded by a codec, a fixed value is used like 128, 256, or 320 kilobits per second. In general, the higher the bit rate, the better the quality of the audio. Now with variable bit rate, it uses all sorts of little tricks to try to maintain the quality while the bit rate varies, right. then letting you squeeze the, the file down even smaller. But it's highly not it's not something that's become an accepted practice at all in voiceover. Yeah. And somebody so, mentioning it is even more bizarre. It's, it is, <laughs> it is rare, but I, I guess they're mentioning it because enough people have been doing it wrong that it needed to be addressed. That's right. So it's so funny. Like I knew what CBR was, but out of context in here, it just didn't really uh, click yeah. what he meant. Well, he did say it Re was a client in the UK. So well, there you go. They, yeah, that's, you know, it doesn't make it wrong. It's just, it means it's something that they bring up far more often. Right. 320 kilobits per second. It should say MP3 CBR, you know, then it would have been like, oh, that's oh, so that, obvious. Yeah, yeah. But um, that's a very high bit rate. I mean, honestly, you can't hear the difference between uh, like a 192 kilobit mono MP3, mono being important. Interestingly, it does not say mono, mono. yeah <laughs> all right. those specs don't say mono it makes a difference folks it does make a difference yeah 100, a hundred uh, 192 kilobit per second mono file sounds audibly better than a stereo one absolutely um so yeah that's fascinating yeah and then then he asks he says i've heard the plug-in loud max which i believe gerard asked about last week uh won't work with os catalina is there a 64-bit equivalent it's so funny. Like there's all these, I've heard questions. Yes. Well, we've where, heard a lot of those. I've heard. I don't questions. know where that was heard, <laughs> but it's not correct. It's not correct. Um, okay. If you go to uh, the loud, the, the website for Thomas Mund, the guy, the genius that came up with the loud max limiter. Yep. Um, he has downloads on there for 32 bit PC, 64 bit PC. And on the uh, Mac side of things, there are plugins for uh, audio units and VST for Mac OS in 32-bit 
and 64-bit. In fact, one download is both versions in one download. So yes, it is definitely 64-bit compatible. Now, I don't know about there being an issue specifically with Catalina. Um, you know, it has to be 64-bit to work on Catalina, but there may be an issue with Catalina not allowing the plugin to run. That's a different story. And I have to admit, I have not tried uh, Loudmax on my current machine, my newest Mac Mini, which does actually have Catalina on it. Yeah. Well, there's um, so probably, I a per, probably a permissions thing. I mean, we've been seeing that as well, that you've got to get permission. You've got to go and like they used to, like you were yes. saying, like they used to do in Windows, like, no, nope, what's, what, you know, what's your password? You got to get in here. Uh, but you've got to go in and you've got to set permissions for it to accept the sound and all this kind of stuff. So honestly, I've almost completely stopped using loud max because if you use the, the AU peak limiter, and then what I do is I'll use peak limiter. And then after that in my stack or my processing, I'll just have a level control to bring it back down to minus three. That seems to handle it. It does essentially the same thing as loud max. It just controls the peaks and then you reset it. So the peaks are at minus three, um, either by normalizing or if you're using a stack, you can use uh, another processor that just lets you change gain. But that seems to do it for me. And I no longer deal with loud max, nothing wrong with loud max, but it's a little more difficult to install than it should be. Um, in fact, I did a YouTube video about it years ago, how to install installing loud max on twisted weight because it's not obvious how to install it. So, um, anyway, give it a shot. Let us know if you've tried it on Catalina. Yeah. I haven't yet. Um, maybe if I have a moment, I'll do so. Yeah. And well, there's that other one called, uh, cupcake. Audio cupcake. Audio cupcake, which is, uh, you know, our, our friend David H. Lawrence has been talking about. Uh, yeah, that's a lot more sophisticated. Yeah. Yeah. Way more sophisticated. Yeah. Now this isn't now Saxman has a couple of interesting questions here because there's no right answer which is the case with a lot of stuff. And he says, with a $500 savings, would you recommend the Rode NTG5 over the MKH416, the vaunted Sennheiser 416? Oh, everybody wants the poor man's 416. Of course. Yeah. Eh. There's been a lot of poor man's 416s out there, um, anywhere from a couple hundred bucks up to, you know, more. This is one of the first ones that really does to me do what a 416 does only better. Um, I've, I've used it. I've demoed it. I've recommended it. Um, we did a big shootout comparison on the pro audio suite podcast, comparing it directly. And at the end of the day, um, in blind taste tests, <laughs> like the Pepsi challenge, uh, the four of us on our show all picked the, uh, NTG5 over the MKH416. Interesting. We just preferred the way it sounded. Hmm. Um, so it has all the positive attributes of the 416 with less of the negatives. Um, it's a lot less expensive. It doesn't weigh as much, which doesn't really matter for, for voiceover, but certainly for someone on a boom pole, they care. Um, it's uh, got better off-axis response. Meaning that when you start to speak a little bit too off axis on a 416, it sound, the yeah. sound gets weird. It doesn't sound, doesn't sound right. It sounds odd. Um, but this mic still sounds okay. Um, it's very, very sensitive. It doesn't need a lot of gain. So you can plug it into any old interface. So it has a lot of advantages, I think. Yeah. Um, so I would say give it a shot. It's, it's a, it's something, you know, the 416 is, is, it's just one of those venerable mics that just about every studio or voice actor at some point has used or has thought about buying. Um, and it's, it's an old design yep. and they've keep come out with new ones. Sennheiser has, but they're even more expensive. So if you're price sensitive, I would recommend checking out the road. Yeah. Now he also asks, since we were talking about this earlier, when moving from an SM seven B, which you never should have been using in the first place for voiceover, would you recommend the NT1, the Rode NT1 or NTG5 as being more the most versatile? Boy, you well, got lots a, of choices. You're a sax man. The SM7B would probably actually be a really good sax mic. Right. <laughs> so maybe you're using it for sax. Um, but um, 
uh, NT1 or the NTG5. So uh, the most versatile. It's not, a, I can't, it's like apples and oranges. Right, you know, the, you the NTG5 is a shotgun mic, so it's extremely good portably, really great uh, to take with you. Works well for rejecting background noise and things like that. But the NT1 is like a very, very affordable Neumann, for lack of a better word. It's a studio Extremely condenser clean. mic. It works great. Studio condenser mic, yeah. You can work it like a condens like a like a large diaphragm condenser mic can be used. So if you're one that wants to work the mic, you really want to be able to play around the proximity effect, work really close to the mic, you might want to go with the NT1. But if you want something that's really consistent in a lot of environments, then the NTG5 is probably a better mic. So it does depend. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Katie Lee asks an, an, a good question here because I've been answering this one all week and I've been getting the same question from a lot of people. It says, is there a high pass filter for twisted wave, which I have to use now because of Catalina? Well, it's it's a simple matter of EQ. A high Let's pass be clear about the question. Yeah. She doesn't need to use a high pass filter because of Catalina. Because she's using Catalina. What she's saying is she has to use twisted wave now because she thinks she can't use audacity because she's on Catalina. Catalina. All right. Well, yeah. Twisted wave has a high pass filter. I mean, it it's got a couple of them actually, but the simplest high pass filter, it's, it's not rocket science. It's not alchemy. Well, maybe a little bit of alchemy. It's literally called high pass, right? It means letting the high frequency, uh, the high frequencies pass through and be audible while the low frequencies are cut out the human voice exists essentially between you know 75 and maybe 16 16 kilohertz right you know unless you know you have a really high voice or a really low voice uh the range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz which is why you see most microphones have that response and most headphones have that type of a response the thing is if a high pass filter is going to reduce or cut out everything below 80 hertz which is generally below everybody's voice <laughs> therefore easy to remove it using a high pass filter if you've got a rumble or something and all you do is you cut off everything below 65 75 hertz take a little bit of a notch at 80 hertz and that's a high pass filter using eq and it it's miraculous so yeah, it's in Twisted Wave. It's in the graphic equalizer, and I believe there is also a high pass filter preset in Twisted Wave, if I'm correct. By the way, I'm using uh like I have many DAWs on my computer because of all the support we do. I'm running Audacity on Catalina for what it's worth. Well, be that way. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Just because the first hit on Google says Mac OS 10.15 Catalina does not support Audacity 2.3.2 doesn't mean that's the only answer <laughs> just because it's the first one. There you go. It actually, there are, you can make it work. There's uh, information online about the workaround to make this work. Yes. It's a little, maybe a little geeky, but it can be done. So um, yeah. yeah, it's not, it's not plug and play quite yet, but it, it is workable. Yep. And Bob Leadham, a wonderful donor to this show uh, says, uh, what considerations are there in a bedroom recording when choosing between an NT1 versus an NTG5. <laughs> well, again, it's the same answer. Yeah. How noisy is the bedroom? Or, you know, or they both, you, if you use it right, it's going to sound okay. Yeah. You're going to get a rate. Maybe you're going to get away with a little bit more ambient background noise with the Rode NTG5 than you would with the NT1. Um, the NTG5 won't be quite as bass sensitive, so it won't pick up as much rumble where the NT1 will pick up all the rumble because it's flat, super flat down to the, to the basement. Um, so yeah, there's some considerations there. I mean, the NTG5 may be a little easier to get away with, um, but you do have to learn how to work in a, a shotgun mic. It's, a, it's definitely a different mic technique and it doesn't really give you the versatility of a, a, certainly a multi-pattern mic. We didn't even talk about that, but the uh nt the road nt2 right it's a switchable paddle pattern mic and this uh vanguard v4 is switchable pattern so not only do you get the cardioid but you get the very rarely used uh omni 
probably rarely ever used in a home studio. Or, but you also get the interesting figure eight, right. which is actually what I'm using tonight. And that gives a mic a lot more, um, a lot more f versatility. If you're looking for something that's a versatile mic. Right. Right. And that's a great, the, that V4 is a great mic because it doesn't come with a big extra power unit. It's, it is what it is. And you plug it in and it does what it does. Katie Lee says, oops, I meant a hard limiter. Oh, not a limit, not a high pass filter, a hard limiter. I swear I haven't been drinking. <laughs> well, Katie, I wish you said you were, because that would have made it a little easier. <laughs> um, yes, there is also a hard limiter in Twisted Wave. Yeah. It happens to be called, if you go into effects, right. effects stacks, I'm sorry, effects, audio units, flat list, Apple, and it's called it's a it's a compressor a u peak limiter peak limiter there you go so peak limiter is a hard limiter yep. so yes there is one built in just as i just a few moments ago was talking about comparison comparison to uh loud max but yes there is one built in yeah so the, here's the thing twisted wave has everything you could possibly need to do voiceover and yeah you know, it's all there and you just have to learn how to use all those individual things. But, you know, going for external, uh, you know, rack mounted uh, channel strips and lots of plugins and stuff, you don't need it. It's all there in Twisted Wave. It's all there in almost every software. It's just built in. You just got to learn how to the use it. Part, yeah. Anyway. Wow. Lots of great questions. We love yeah, questions. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So anyway, but George and I just love answering these because we could talk forever on this stuff and usually do once we finish doing this show <laughs> anyway thanks for your questions if you have a question for us you of course can write to us at the guys at vobs dot tv uh or you can you know if you watch the show live you can of course write uh, write it into the chat room too but we like getting these questions in advance so we can like as we were doing tonight googling and saying what the heck is he talking about uh <laughs> just to make sure anyway uh those are all your questions for tonight. We'll have more coming up and we'll be right back to uh, sweep our way into this next week of whatever is going to happen with this coronavirus thing right after this. This is Bill Ratner and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Well, hey there, Hero. We interrupt the award-winning shenanigans of VoiceOver Body Shop for this public service announcement. 
1.5 billion. That's how many students there are in the world. Primary, secondary, college, university, 1.5 billion. And that's how many were sent home several weeks ago, along with the 90 million teachers and professors who teach them. And as they left, those teachers and professors were all told by their principals and deans, hey, keep teaching your classes from home, okay? Yeah, you know how to do that, what, that Facebook Live thing and that YouTube and that Zoom thing? You know how to do that, don't you? Sure, everybody does, except many of those teachers don't even know where to start. What camera to use, what microphone to use how to set up lights, how to use Zoom, and what makes online classes different from in-person classes. But I do. I know how to do that. I've been doing that for years, and I thought, well, maybe I can help. So I spent day and night for the past few weeks putting together a course on how teachers can do all that. And I figured, uh, you know what, I'll sell it for 49 bucks. Anybody can afford 49 bucks, right? But then... At the last minute, I decided to do something different. I decided to set aside the money and give it away for free. So now through May 6th, any teacher can have the course forever for free. And I've got a favor to ask of you. If you're a teacher, or if you know a teacher or two, and with 90 million in the world who doesn't know a teacher or two, would you let them know about this? The course is available at teachyourcourseonline.com. And I'm going to ask Dan and George to make that link available on the VOBS website and maybe mention it a time or two on the air and in the notices that they sent out. Would you guys do that for me? Okay, great. The course again is at teachyourcourseonline.com. Help me help teachers be heroes at home as well as in the classroom. That's teachyourcourseonline.com. Thank you very much. You're watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. And we are back one more time here on VoiceOver Body Shop. Thanks for all your questions, guys. Great questions. We get them all week. Most of the, a lot, a lot of the ones we get on, you know, in email are like, what? Uh, <laughs> this week it was a, a little, these were good questions. Send them in to us. Uh, next week on this very show, we'll have another guest. Stay tuned for that. And then the following week, it'll be tech talk number, which number, George? 33. 33. Very good. Yay. Got it right. Okay. Who are our donors of the week? Michelle Blanker, Robert Leadham. Thanks, Robert. Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir, Trey Mosley, Tom Pinto, Natasha Marchuka, my dad. Happy birthday, Dad. His birthday was last week. Uh, Patty Gibbons, Diana Birdsall, Mike Gordon, and Dwayne DeSalvo. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. We certainly do. Hey, you know, we're, we're using the new set because we're all over the place, so we figured we'd be really cool and use the new set. Uh, but uh, we'd love to see your home studio. So if you've got a, a picture of your home studio taken in landscape, not portrait, We'd love to have it on our show so we could be George. When George and I get back together, which could be years, uh, we will be in your studio. And that's really cool. And you can send it to the guys at VOBS.TV. Uh, we need to uh, thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's Voice Over Essentials. Voice Over Extra. You got it. Source Elements. Voheroes.com, voiceactorwebsites.com, and JMC Demos. All righty. And the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the betterment of live and, of course, recorded webcasting. Jeff Holman for a great job in the chat room tonight. And Sue Merlino for getting it done from all the way from Burbank. Even though we're, I'm where I am, you are where you are, she is where she is, and she's getting it done. And, of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. There she is. Hi, Sue. We love you. All righty. That's going to do it for us this week. Uh, you got questions? Send them in to us. This is not an easy business. You got to have the tech down along with the great acting ability you have. And we're here to answer your questions on that. And, of course, help you professionally. Uh, that's doing it for this week. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO. BS. BS Tech Talk. See you next time, guys.